morning. Thankful to be able to come and to uh, spend a little time together. Uh, thankful for the songs, that, that last one, hallelujah, as we uh, do realize that we're going to praise the Lord. And we praise Him here, but man, I tell you what, when we get to heaven and we're free from sin, we're going to really understand what praising the Lord really is. When we see Him in His glory and when we see Him in all His power and might, uh, we're going to really praise Him. Now, yes, I do have a green, my green sport coat on. I don't wear this very often. And I do have a Christmas tie on. I was telling some I have four Christmas ties. Four. And then I have one that has snowflakes on it. So that's five. So I have to start in November to wear them all at least once a year. And so that's what we're trying to do this morning. <laughs> we're ready for Christmas, though. Thanksgiving has passed, and, and we want to be thankful every day of our lives for what God has done. Uh, we move on into the Christmas season. And we're going to do things a little different this morning. We're going to, we're going to have a message today first. And at the end of that, for our kids who don't fall asleep, I want to spend just a little moment with them at the end of the service before we are dismissed. So don't let me forget that with our kids at the end of the service today. So uh, if you've got your Bibles, if you will, turn to Matthew chapter 5 this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 5. We've been going through uh, the Beatitudes or the beautiful attitudes uh, there in the Scriptures. Uh, we're going to finish out the Beatitudes today, and we come to, to Matthew chapter 5, verse number 10 is where we are. If you will, please stand with me and honor the Word of God. We'll read it together. Uh, Matthew 5, uh, verse number 10 uh, through 12. So the Scripture says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray and bless God's word. Father, we thank you uh, for this opportunity to come together to worship you today. We ask that you to bless your word. We ask God that you would Put your words in our mouth to give to your people. Strengthen, encourage, exhort today, Father, for those who need to hear it. If there's anybody that's lost today in our midst, may you speak to them and draw them to salvation today. They would get things right with you and have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Use it today, Father, and preach through us. In Christ's name we pray, and amen. You may be seated. May God bless his word today. Uh, we thank God uh, for the Beatitudes. And I dare say that if these were our daily attitudes of life, our days would be a whole lot better. But this final beatitude, it bookends with the first one's promise of the kingdom of heaven being the reward. But it also links persecuted believers of today with the prophets of old and their suffering. So when you think about that, you read the first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And then you come to verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven or for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. We understand that us, for us as believers, the great reward that we have is the kingdom of heaven. Now we ask in our Sunday school class this morning, uh, where is the kingdom of heaven now? And we know that the kingdom of heaven dwells inside of each, in each and every believer today. Now, of course, God dwells in heaven, which we understand that's where, in essence, his throne is at, where Christ is at his right hand and such. And Christ is going to come back someday. And Christ will reign here on the earth when he remakes everything new. And, and the kingdom of heaven will be here and the kingdom of heaven will be there. But it's ultimately, it's within us that the kingdom of heaven is within us. But we will dwell with God someday in his presence. So we, in, in studying over this passage and over this, we were drawn to three questions. And then, in essence, a question, a statement, ever how you want to take it at the end. And any of these questions that we read today can be taken as statements of fact as well, not just as a question. So the first thing we'll look at this morning is persecuted for being good or, in a statement-wise, 
persecuted for being good. We, why would someone be persecuted for doing what is good? Why would we want to persecute somebody for doing what is good? Do you know God requires us to be holy? You know, down in, in, in the end of chapter 5, uh, in verse number 48, the Bible says in Matthew 5, 48, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Wow, that's awful, isn't it? Be perfect. Is anybody here perfect? Anybody here got a perfect wife? Perfect husband. Come on, Brandy, raise your hand. No, Brandy didn't even raise her hand. Because nobody here is perfect, right? None of us are perfect. But he is. But he requires for us to be perfect. Now, when we think about this perfection that we're to have, where do we wrap our minds around persecution there? If Jesus is the only one who is perfect, then why in the world was he persecuted while he was here on the earth? Was he not persecuted? Oh, yes, he was. He requires us to be perfect. He requires for us to live holy lives. But yet we, he knows that we can't. That's why his son Jesus Christ came to live and to die for us on the cross and pay for our sins. And he's drawing us. He's taking us. He's preparing us for our perfect life in heaven. Over in 1 Peter uh, chapter number 1, and we, we may be turning to a few different places today, uh, but you just follow along as best as possible. And if you need a reference at the end, we'll be glad to give that to you. In 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse number 6, as you rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. You rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. Have you ever met someone who claims to be a Christian or is one and cannot wrap their minds around that since they've been saved or since they've made this profession of faith that something has gone wrong and they're, they're shocked by this? Nowhere in the scriptures does it tell us that once we become a follower of Christ that nothing bad is ever going to happen to us. We are prone to suffer. We are going to go through times of suffering. We're going to go through times of loss and heartache. We're not immune to the sufferings of the normal human experience of life. We get sick. We get old. We get feeble. We face death. Those are all things that we understand are suffering for just being human. Christ doesn't insulate us from that. He doesn't like withhold death from any of us. We're all going to face death unless he returns uh, to take us home before our time comes to an end. And Christ could come back today. We understand that. But persecuted for being good. For being good. Why would you do that? Why would this happen? Jesus told us, he told us, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. Don't be surprised because the world hates you because they hated me from the beginning. And they persecuted the most perfect person ever when he was here. Even in his own hometown of Nazareth. He went in and read from the scriptures and began to speak and teach on them that day. And when he came to a certain passage and told them that, they, in essence, they, they were persecuted, they were sinful, they wanted to take him out and throw him off the hill that their city was built upon. Why? He, all he did was tell them the truth. He was being good. The greatest man to ever walk the face of the planet was Jesus. Yes, I know he was God too, but... He's still perfect. Healed the sick, opened the eyes of the blind, made the lame walk, raised the dead to life. And yet they wanted to persecute him. Now, when you live a holy, when you live in a holy estate, and let me, let me just remind you of this. If you are a follower of Christ, you are working towards holiness. Something holy abides in you. His name is Jesus. And because of this, you are marked by the enemy. 
you're marked by the adversary, Satan himself. Now, he may not be the one after you, but he sends one of his goons after you because he wants to discourage you. He wants to have you down and depressed. He wants to have you silent about your witness. He wants you not talking about Jesus Christ to anybody that you come in contact with. He wants you to be silent. But when you speak about Christ, when you speak about him, there's when the persecution comes out because the enemy doesn't want you telling people about Jesus Christ because somebody else might get saved. God heaven forbid, right? That if we tell somebody about Jesus, they might get saved. It, it is our greatest joy. It is our greatest experience of life to introduce someone to Jesus. To tell them who he is, what he's done, where he's brought us from, and where he wants to bring them from and take them to. It should be our, the greatest thing we do in life. It's to tell people about Jesus. But be warned, when you do, when you do, you will be marked by the enemy. Because he doesn't want you telling people about Jesus. Doing a good thing will bring persecution. But it's okay. <laughs> It's all right. God has you in his hands. God has you protected. So persecuted for being good. It happens. We go through this kind of persecution for being good. Notice, notice in our world today, in our society today, that uh, standing up for the Bible's beliefs are, are quickly and more often than not being pushed aside as, as not being prevalent for today or rele relevant for today. They're not in, in good standings as they used to be, it seems. But the people don't want to hear them. And they were, we're told to be silent. Keep your opinions to yourself. Well, I hear everybody else's opinion all day long, don't you? And I don't have an opinion. I have facts. I have a belief. I have a faith. And yet I'm persecuted because of that. Now, yes, I can disagree with somebody's opinion. And people can disagree with my faith. And that's fine. I can get over that. But understand this. I don't persecute them. I don't tell them to shut up and be silent because they say something that I disagree with. I let them have their time. I let you have your time if you let me have mine to speak what the Word of God says. And there's where we see the confrontation. People don't want to hear the truth of God's word. So we're persecuted for being good. Secondly, we look at blessed when you're insulted and persecuted. You're blessed. Jesus says you are blessed when they insult you and persecute you. Anybody ever felt that way? People say all kinds of things about you. They insult you. They persecute you. And you walk away, man, I am blessed. <laughs> Praise the Lord, I'm blessed, right? That's what Jesus says we're to be. That we are. We're blessed when we are persecuted. We find this so hard to understand, comprehend, and even get over. There are several people today in this world that are the believers that have been persecuted for their faith, and they're silent now. They're silent. Because they don't want to go through the insults again or the persecution again. They're afraid. They're living in essence in terror of what could happen next if they say something for Jesus. Now understand this, there are people today in this world that are living in places where openly sharing their faith can mean the end of their life physically. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters that face that because they're just like us. They have eyes, hair, noses, and mouths just like we do. They have hands and feet, just like we do. They have a heart like we do. Their skin may be darker, it may be lighter, it may be whatever. Their hair may be different shades, different uh, way they fix it, whatever. But they have a same soul that we have. And that soul has accepted Christ as their Savior. That makes them my brother and my, or my sister in the faith. And I'm to pray for them, to earnestly ask God to help them in their witness and to protect them if that's His will. It may be that they do stand up and they lose their life for their faith. We understand we are blessed when we're insulted. Paul was persecuted and insulted, was he not? Turn, if you will, to uh, 2 Timothy. If you've got your Bibles there. 2 Timothy. 
I have way too many markers today. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 8, the Bible says, So don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. This has now been made evident through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. And that is why I suffer these things. But I am not ashamed. We sing this song sometimes because I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. What a beautiful passage of Scripture. Look, Paul says, again, for this gospel, I was appointed a herald, apostle, and teacher. And this is why I suffer these things. I suffer because I am a believer. Paul would later write to Timothy in chapter 3. Listen to this. But know this, hard times will come in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, proud, demeaning, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers without self-control, brutal without love for what is good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holy, to the form of godliness, but denying his power, avoid these people. This is where we are now, folks. This is where we are now. Paul mentions in that same passage, the rest of chapter 3, mentions Janus and Jambres. Those are the two magicians who stood against Moses in Egypt. They persecuted Moses. They tried to imitate the plagues that Moses was doing. Until one of them, I believe it was either the plague of boils or the lice, they couldn't duplicate it. And they told Pharaoh, this is the hand of God. We can't do it. They were put down because of their persecution. Now, on the end of chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, Paul writes to him. Now he's writing to this young man who was falling after him. And he knew Timothy was going to be persecuted. Verse 10, but you have followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance, along with the persecutions and suffering that came to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. What persecutions I endured, and yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, look here, in fact, in verse 12, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus are going to be persecuted. So you're blessed when you're insulted and when you're persecuted. You're blessed when that happens to you. False teachers. Now, flip over, if you will, to, to Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I know I told you I had a lot of different references today, but this was it. maybe that's why you all didn't sing as much this morning, so you knew I had a lot, a lot to read. I didn't tell nobody either. But in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 16, I repeat. Now, I, this, this is the... You have to understand the context of this passage before I read it. I have to take this a moment aside. Within the church at Corinth, there were these men who claimed that they were the super apostles. They didn't use that term, but that's how they labeled themselves. They were superior to everybody else there, and especially superior to the apostle Paul. So Paul wrote this letter to combat their false teaching. Here's what he says. I repeat, let no one consider me a fool. But if you do, at least accept me as a fool so that I can also boast a little. What am I saying in this manner of boasting? I don't speak as the Lord would, but as it were foolishly. Since many boast according to the flesh, I will also boast. For you being so wise, gladly put up with fools. 
In fact, you put up with it if someone enslaves you, if someone exploits you, if someone takes advantage of you, if someone is arrogant towards you, if someone slaps you in the face. I say this to your shame. We have been too weak for that. But in whatever anyone dares to boast, I am talking foolishly, I also dare. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm talking like a madman. I'm a better one with far more labors, many more imprisonments, far worse beatings, many times near death. Five times I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. Three times I was beat with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I was spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I have faced dangers from rivers, from robbers, from my own people, from Gentiles in the city, in the wilderness, dangers at sea, and dangers among false brothers, toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing. Not to mention other things. There is the daily pressure on me, my concern for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do not burn with indignation. If boasting is necessary, I will boast about my weakness. The God and Father, the Lord Jesus, who is blessed forever, knows I am not lying. In Damascus, a ruler under King Artus guarded the city of Damascus in order to arrest me. So I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped from his hands. Now, the reason why I read that all to you, and I know it's lengthy, but there within that church were people who were claiming they were persecuted for the faith of Christ. And they weren't. They were false teachers only looking to deceive the congregation and to follow them. Paul wrote to the church pointing that their fallacy out, their falsehoods and their lies out to them, to the church there. You read the rest of the first and second Corinthians, you read both books there, both letters, and you see where Paul was combating them. Well, within him, when he started combating their false teaching, they began to insult Paul. They said, this good you can't speak. He, he, he writes a lot. He sounds great in his letter, but it's nothing like when he shows up here. Paul says, <laughs> Paul would later write, when I do get there, I will show you how strong I am in Christ. Paul wasn't boasting. I know when he says, I'm talking like a madman, Paul was pointing out their boasts were of their flesh. Paul says they can boast in their flesh all they want to about their experiences with Christ, but here's what I've suffered for Jesus. And he went through that litany of all the sufferings he had went through for Christ. He wasn't seeking glory. He wasn't seeking fame for that. He was showing what he had done for the name of Jesus. All because he was preaching the gospel, he suffered. All who want to live a godly life are going to suffer persecution. It's going to happen. Paul is the prime example of that after Jesus. Jesus suffered because he was good. Paul suffered because he was doing the work of Jesus. The other, uh, the other saints did as well. Now, over in the book of Acts, I'm not going to apologize for having many references because if I don't reference the scripture, you won't know where it's at. Okay, uh, You have to look it up. But in Acts 12, we're going to read that a few passages there in just a moment. But as we turn to that, we're persecuted for being good. We're blessed when you're insulted and persecuted. And then are we falsely accused because of Jesus? Has anybody ever lied about you? Falsely accused you of something because you're a Christian? Have they ever seen you somewhere where Christians aren't supposed to go? And falsely accused you of being just like the world. It's happened to many of us. We don't always, we don't always portray Christ in the best light sometimes. And then we're falsely accused of being, falsely accused of being a hypocrite, of being someone that's just deceiving everybody else, looking the part but not really the part. Understand that when the church, after Paul's, Paul saw at the time he rose up and began to persecute the church and threw many in prison. 
Then on the road to Damascus, Jesus met him and changed his life. After that, there was a time of peace. But then, but then after this, another persecution arose. And, and, and James was arrested there in chapter 12 of the book of Acts. If you'll turn there with me, if you will. I'll just skim over this really quickly. Uh, there in Acts chapter 12, verse 1, uh, Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church, and he executed James, John's brother, uh, with a sword. Then he arrested Peter. There in that same passage, uh, Peter was, was thrown in prison, and then later that night, the night before he was going to be executed himself, God sent an angel and rescued Peter and brought him out safely. Remember, he, the, he went to where the church was meeting at, at the house, at somebody's house, and they were praying for Peter. And Peter's outside knocking on the door, and, and the girl named Rhoda came and, and saw him and ran back inside and told everybody, Peter's outside, and they thought she was crazy, that they had seen his ghost or his spirit of some type. And Peter kept knocking, hey, I'm really out here. He was. Both of those men, James and Peter, had been falsely accused, in essence, of stirring up trouble, stirring up the people. And now, I'm going to give you some homework. Acts 21, 22, and 23. I want you to read that this week about suffering. I go back to the Apostle Paul. Paul, after his missionary journeys, ended back up in Jerusalem. And there, he knows he's going to be persecuted there. He knows. Some of the brothers have tried to keep him from going there. And he's told them, hey, why are you, why are you making me sad? Not only am I ready to go to Jerusalem, I'm ready to go and die there if that's God's will. He knew he was going to be persecuted because he knew they were looking for him. Because Paul, on his missionary journeys... He would go into every synagogue in any town he went to. He would go in that synagogue first and he would proclaim Jesus Christ as the Messiah. For those who would believe, they would accept. But many of them, in most towns he went to, uh, most of the Jews would not accept him. Paul would then go to the Gentile people and proclaim that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, the creator of all the universe and mankind. And the Jews hated that because he, would, he was a Jew and he would go to the Gentiles. They hated that. And they tried to persecute him. They ran him out of town. They stoned him. Threw him in prison. And all this such. They lied about falsely accused him. Now Paul's in Jerusalem and they falsely accuse him of polluting the temple. There in chapter 21. And they are about to just stone him, beat him, kill him. The Romans come down and rescue him to some degree. And allow him to speak. And they, he speaks to the people in the Hebrew tongue. And they listen to him intently until he mentions that Jesus was the one that God had sent. And then they begin a, all this litany of wanting to kill him. The next day he's brought down to the Sanhedrin. There he's falsely accused again. And he's had to be, he has to be taken to Caesarea by the Romans to escape the persecution. He was nearly torn in half. Do you see what these men suffered because of Jesus? They were lied about, falsely accused of blaspheming God when all they were doing was telling people who God was. All who want to live a godly life are going to suffer persecution. I'm not trying to scare you or trying to tell you you don't want to be a Christian because you do want to be a believer in Christ. You, there's nothing better you can be. There's nothing better you can have than Jesus Christ as your Savior. There's nothing better. Because even though you might suffer, your suffering is only temporary. If you die not knowing Christ, your judgment is eternal. It's permanent. There's no escape from it. Not, the suffering that I go through in this life will end someday when I leave here and go to heaven. It'll come to an end. But for those who don't know Christ and they die in their sins, when they go to hell, there is no escape from them. No escape from there. And we don't want anybody to go there. That's why we preach Jesus Christ. And then lastly, 
We go back to our beatitude in Matthew 5. You are blessed when they insult and persecute you and false and say every kind of evil against you because of me. Remind yourself of this. They are persecuting you, me, and all the church today because we know Jesus Christ. They hated Jesus. The world did. The world still hates Jesus. We love him. So that makes the world hate us and want us silent. Well, we're not going to be silent. We can't be silent. We have to proclaim the name of Jesus. We have to. It burns inside of us. And Jeremiah had this burning inside of him because he wanted to proclaim the word of God. He couldn't get over it. Meet somebody who's called to speak about Jesus who hasn't had an opportunity in a while. You, you'll, you'll see it sometimes. They're, they're burning on the inside. They just can't. They've got to find somebody to talk to Jesus about, you know? We need more people like that. But the beatitude in the end of verse 12 says, Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Huh. Two times in these verses here, Jesus tells us we're blessed when we're persecuted. Two times. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, and then you are blessed when they insult and persecute you, say, falsely say every kind of evil against you. Be glad and rejoice. 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 People's words hurt, though, don't they? People's actions against us, they hurt. Jesus says to be glad and rejoice because our reward is great in heaven. Our reward is great in heaven. And here's the thing. We're not alone in our suffering. We're not alone in our persecution. We're not alone in the sorrow that we go through and we bear through when people lie about us and falsely accuse us and insult us and persecute us. We're not alone in that. Now, I need to tell you this. We here where we live don't face many of the persecutions that our brothers and sisters do in other parts of our own nation, even our own state, and of course in the world. But we have to remind ourselves, when we suffer, they suffer. When they suffer, we suffer. When they're persecuted, it's in essence they're persecuting us as well. Remember what Jesus told to, to, to Saul on the road to Damascus? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? When we're persecuted because of righteousness in the name of Jesus, it's not just us they're trying to get rid of, they're trying to get rid of Jesus. And remind, let me remind you, they can't get rid of him. Because he's God. He holds all things together today. In Acts 5, verse 40 and 42, the disciples had been arrested, thrown in prison. Angel came out and let them out. Remember that? Let them out. They're out there the next morning preaching the gospel again. They're brought before the Sanhedrin. Told them, you, we told you not to speak of his name no more. Can't help it. We got to do it. So they beat them and I told them again, stop telling people about Jesus. Acts 5, verse 40 through 42 tells us that when they left, what were they doing? They were rejoicing because they were found worthy to suffer because of the name of Jesus. They were rejoicing because they were, they were dealing with the same suffering that Christ dealt with. They rejoiced because of that. And then lastly, if you got your Bibles, Come to close in Hebrews chapter number 11. The heroes of faith, this is what this passage has been labeled at many times. But toward the end, in verse 36 of Hebrews 11, I want you to look at our fellow brothers and sisters. Hebrews 11, verse 36. Others experience mockings and scourgings as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. 
They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised, since God has provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. Do you see those believers before us? Now, I know the Beatitude says, for that is how they persecute the prophets who were before you. Go back and look at some of the suffering the prophets went through in the Old Testament and even in the New. They suffered because of Jesus. They were looking for Christ to come. Christ has come. Now we're looking for him to return. We stand alongside the Old Testament prophets today in their suffering. We are linked with them now through that suffering. But we're more so we're linked through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. All who want to live a godly life are going to be persecuted. They're going to suffer for Jesus. And it's not something to be ashamed of, not something to be destitute over and give up on. Be glad and rejoice. If you are suffering for Jesus, that means your witness is clearly evident to the world. That means people see Jesus in you. They don't like it, but I want to tell you something. Somebody will like it. Because I want to tell you something about my life story. Somebody who had Jesus inside of them told me about him. They told me about him, and through their labors of love and prayers, God drew me to salvation. You may encounter two people today. One will hate you for what you believe in, but one will understand what you believe in and accept what you believe in, and they'll be saved. You might happen. Try and see what happens. Don't get broken hearted over the one who insults you and walks away. Rejoice over the one who believes. Be glad and rejoice when you're persecuted. Be glad and rejoice because we're walking with Jesus when we're persecuted for his name. That means they're seeing the change he's made in us. They can't deny it. I, I've, we've encountered people who have, after their, their, their conversion uh, to faith in Christ Jesus, they've lost friends because of that. Even some have lost family members because of that. I know, that, I know that's hard to rejoice over. It's hard to. But think about what you got in return when you met him. You may have gotten better friends, hopefully. <laughs> you got a better family. I'll dare say this, you got a bigger family. Because when you got saved, I, I, I like to tell, especially kids, when, they, when, when, when we've experienced salvation with them here at the church, and, and I get a moment to talk to them afterwards. I said, do you know what now you are? You're my brother or sister in Christ. You're now part of my family. And I'm part of yours. We're one in Christ now. Be glad and rejoice when you're persecuted for Christ. Because that means your witness is being evident to those around you. And God can use that witness to draw somebody to faith in him. And that's our goal. That's our purpose. That's our mission to lead people to Jesus and out of the sins of this world. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. Thank you for your, your, your helping us today. And I know there's a lot to cover. And Father, thank you, though, for your word. Your word speaks for itself. Your word can stand on its own. But Father, thank you for your presence today, for your goodness. And God, help us as your people. When we're persecuted... Uh, to understand that we're just like the prophets in the Old Testament, how they were persecuted. They were lied about. The disciples were lied about. Uh, they, uh, even Paul, before he met you on the road to Damascus, he lied about the church. He put him in prison, falsely accused him of blasphemy until he met you and you changed his life. God, help us to let our light be so bright that people either are drawn to you in faith or they run away from us in shame. And I don't mean that in, in a bad way. You know my heart. 
God, I want people to understand who we are as believers. We are your children, and we're called to tell others about you. And that means we have to be evident in our world today of who we are, not ashamed of the gospel, not ashamed of who we are, not ashamed to be a follower of Jesus, but to boldly proclaim the gospel to those we come in contact with. And not everybody's going to accept it. Help us in those moments when we're persecuted to lean upon you, to cry out to you, to hold on to you, and to find the rejoicing that we've been called worthy to suffer shame for your name. For the blessed days that anybody here lost, God, speak to them and draw them to salvation. Anybody here, God, that is discouraged, that has been persecuted, that's going through it now, that's about ready to say, I can't tell people about Jesus no more. God, encourage them today, empower them today, build them up today uh, to keep pressing on, to keep pressing on to finish the race that you have set before them. Father, we love you and praise you. We give you the honor and glory in Christ's name. And amen.